You might think talking about the state of the world is hardly a glass half full or half empty kind of conversation. Or is it? By several measures, people have never had it better, and they're reaping the rewards of centuries of progress. But try telling them that. Joining us now to consider how much it's a matter of perspective. In Washington, D.C., Greg Easterbrook. He's contributing editor at The Atlantic and the author of It's Better Than It Looks, Reasons for Optimism in an Age of Fear. And back here in our studio, Janice Stein, the Bellsburg Professor of Conflict Management at the Monk School of Global Affairs, and Quam McKenzie, CEO of the Wellesley Institute, psychiatrist at CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And we're delighted to welcome you, too, back to our studio. And Greg, first time in a long time that we've had you on. Let's just, um, let's put these stats out here to set the table for the discussion to come. Sheldon, if you would, this graphics package. In the middle of the 18th century, the average life expectancy in the world was 29 years. Today, it is 71.4 years, and in Canada, it's 82. In the year 1820, 90% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. Today, that number has sunk to 10%, with almost half that decline occurring in the last 35 years. In 1981, almost 9 in 10 Chinese lived in extreme poverty. Now, just 1 in 10 does. In 1981, just half the world's population had access to safe water. Now, more than 90% do. In 1947, 50% of those living in the developing world were undernourished. In 1970, that number fell to 35%. Today, 13%. In the early 1800s, the literacy rate in the world was just above 10%. It is now above 80%. And one more, how about this? Americans are even safer from, yes, see that picture? Lightning strikes. There has been a 37-fold decline since the turn of the 20th century in the likelihood that if you're American, you're gonna be hit by a bolt of lightning. So there. Janice, to you first. These are the facts on progress. Why are so many people disinclined to believe them? Because facts don't speak for themselves, Steve. So let me start there. Uh, it's. Uh, there's overwhelming evidence, and here there is a different set of facts, there's overwhelming evidence that people read and understand facts from where they're sitting. So are they better off? Are their children likely to be better off? Um, and people make relative judgments. Um, in other words, it's not absolute, these, so these facts are not gonna be very helpful to them. They wanna know, and they compare within their own historical memory. And many parents today will tell you that they think their kids will have a tougher time than they will in North America. Let me put that to Greg. Greg, it, uh, stats are one thing, but my own experience is another thing. Do you understand the distinction of why people may not want to believe that they're better than they really are? Well, of course, in, in my book, It's Better Than It Looks, I call this collapse anxiety. Uh, we all have, not all, but most of us have this unfocused fear that something's going to go wrong that, cause, that will cause the Western way of life to come crashing down. I don't think it will, but I sure can't prove that. Nobody can be sure that that won't happen. And we, at, at the second level, as Janice mentioned, we expect income, material standards, et cetera, to continually rise through most of the post-war era. They've almost doubled per generation. I think we need to change our expectation in that regard. It's much more, most people in the, in, in the North America have a good standard of living now. The important thing is to sustain that standard of living for gen many generations, not to think that we could double the size of our houses or double the power of our cars or any of those things again. Quam, do you wanna push back on this at all? I think that um, one of the, I think, best lines that there ever was in a British parliament was that there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> yes. And I think yeah. one has to always be careful with statistics. Here's, here's an example. If the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, the average stays the same. Hmm. But right. life has significantly changed because the gap between rich and poor is very important for everybody's experience of life. So you have to be sort of slightly careful with average statistics and you have to delve de a bit deeper. For instance, when uh, I saw the statistics of life expectancy, yep, they're completely right. Life expectancy has gone up from 29 years to 71 years, but that is mainly due to infant mortality. So, you know, a 29 year old now and a 20, you know, a, a, sorry, a 50 year old now and a 50 year old then would have a difference in life expectancy, but not as much as you think. 
Hmm. Because by the time you got to 50, you got a reasonable life expectancy. But so you ha- have to be that, a bit careful with e- e- statistics. Even, even, even if infant mortality rates have dropped significantly, I mean, that's progress still, isn't it? No, we're making progress. Okay. But we know that because we're not in caves. So, <laughs> just, so we're making yeah, I, progress, you know, right? And, and just to chime in on this, hmm. uh, because I think the fundamental debate here, Steve, or one of the fundamental debates is, what do we mean by progress? Is it principally material? And almost all the statistics you read have to do with improvement in some way in material standards. Or are we talking about progress in the broad enlightenment sense of the term, which is the first time really that that comes into our vocabulary as moral progress, Mm -hmm. founded on the human capacity to reason. That's where that concept really comes from. And there I think there are grounds for deep pessimism, frankly. Deep pessimism. Deep pessimism. Quinn. I mean, I think inequality is important. Mm. So uh, an example would be, and this is how sometimes things uh, get lost. Uh, I come home from work the first day. I've got two sweets. I've got two boys. Give one to one boy, one to another boy. Everybody's happy. Come home the second day. I've got four sweets. I give two to one boy, two to the other day. uh, But other boy, everybody's happy. Mm. Come home. The third day, I've got five sweets. Mm. I give two to one boy, three to the other boy. Everything goes wrong, (laughs) right? Nobody's happy. Now, in theory, we've got five more sweets in the house than we had on the first day, and everybody should be happy, and it should be progress, but, like, that's not the world that most people live in. Because the notion of equality is more important than bounty in that case. It's because relative it's relative, it's relative equality. and equality. it's not that we it's not that it's bad, it's just that you have to understand that let that's get, how people let me get, work. One more point yeah. to, and Greg um, made this argument easy. It's not about doubling our expectations of living standards. That's not the point of Quam's story. They were happier when they could divide t- into two mm-hmm. fairly and people felt it was fair, so that's a moral meaning of progress, and unhappier when they had more, with five. That's the underlying notion of progress, which is based on moral reasoning and a sense of fairness. That's what's at deep risk Okay, well, let me pick this apart a little more. We'll go back to Greg and Washington for this. You know, if you're in the union movement today, you wouldn't necessarily say that things are the best they've ever been. If you're in the civil rights movement today, even with the progress that's been made over the years, uh, the, the sort of post-Obama orgy of, I don't know what you want to call it, that's going on in your country right now, could lead some to believe that the civil rights movement is not the best that it's ever been right now. Uh, would you say that, that the kind of pessimism around those two movements alone is kind of a prerequisite for positive change at some point in the future? Let me take on two aspects of that ar- argument, Steve. First, inequality. There's no doubt that inequality is rising in the United States, in Canada, and in most, although not all, nations of the European Union. Uh, it's a big concern. It's bad for the social fabric, and don't take my word for it. Take the word of Milton Friedman, who 50 years ago, Milton Friedman, for you viewers who don't know, is the crown prince of capitalist economics. And 50 years ago, he said the ultimate threat to American society was inequality. So it's a big concern. Globally, inequality is in decline. The line I use, and it's better than it looks, is that I'm in Washington, D.C., is that wonderful things are happening just not here. Most of the progress in the world is happening outside the Western countries. Inequality globally is in decline. And Janice, since you, you, you mentioned moral reasoning and the power of, of moral thought, for the last 25 years, war has been in decline. You wouldn't believe it from what you see on cable news, but both frequency and intensity of combat are in a 25-year cycle of decline, and that's even if you include the secondary effects that, that are caused to civilians by economic boycotts and other problems associated with war. It's only 25 years that maybe not long enough to draw a hard conclusion from, but there are some reasons to think that human morality is actually on an upswing. No, but Janice, they, that's an empirically provable fact. I mean, no, the, the, hey, the, the no, fact is, if you grew up, I mean, you, yeah, no, did you it, grow up in World War? I mean, you, you were. Here's you were, the fact. You were a little kid during World War II. The, yeah, the world's a more peaceful yeah, place today so than it was the, when you were a kid. No, the world has fewer interstate conflicts than it did. Wars between mm-hmm. states, but civilians dying from and displaced by civil wars is high. Mm-hmm. So one graph has gone down, one graph has gone up. Now, we had 30 years of hell, which was 1940 
14 until 1944, mm -hmm. um, which is, was in fact, came after a decade in the early 1900s where people believed in progress, human reason, improvement in material con conditions, expansion of infrastructure, and short wars. That's what people talked about and wrote about in the decade before that dreadful 30 years that I've just talked about. All right, can I ask you to put the psychiatrist hat on for a second here? Are, are we hardwired, Quam, to be fearful, worry warts, nervous, constantly worried about what our situation is? I think, there is, I think that we are hardwired uh, for the human condition, which is about progress. And um, I don't think it's pessimism. I actually think it's hope. So if we just settle, we don't move forward. Yeah. So people want better things. They want a better world. Uh, they want an easier life and they want to enjoy. And that's what we're hardwired to. And that's how we get, as I said, that's how we get from the caves to the moon. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how we get there. I think it's calling it pessimism, uh, a, a realistic uh, appraisal of where we were and where we are and where we want to go. I don't think it's pessimism, but I, I just want to actually, I think it's important to get the stats right. I actually looked at the World Bank uh, website, pulled the data and plotted it myself. We are much more unequal now than right. we were in 1800. Who's the we? The, uh, world. the world. The whole world. The whole world. We are right. much more unequal. Absolutely if you look right. at the, if you actually plot the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality, income inequality, and you plot it from 1820 to uh, 2018, we are a lot more unequal That's than we right. were. I want to see if China is more unequal. Well, if you actually look at China, which has done this miraculous right. thing in lifting half a billion people out of poverty, it's an astonishing story. It is far more unequal today, Steve, than it was before this started. Okay, but Stephen Pinker tells us that, that un, un, what's the word I'm looking for? Unequality? In inequality. 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 inequality is not the sort of metric that we ought to be worried about right. here. It's whether the eradication of poverty is happening. Yeah, and if the rich are getting even richer, that's fine as long as the poor are getting richer too. I know. That's, so, that's, so, I want Greg on that. Greg, deep, can you weigh in on that? Yeah, deeply. And then let's deep, back in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure, 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 guys. I, I'm, I'm in Washington where we are desperately struggling with the idea that facts, not telephone, what's on your social media, on your phone, should dominate debate. And the, and the notion that facts should dominate debate is kind of losing right now in Washington. But I'll tell you, I'll disagree with one thing, and this, this shows how imperial the, even the things that we want to agree on as objective facts can be. My book has a, has a chapter that's dominated by World Bank data on the Gini coefficient, and I show the Gini coefficient is improving in the last 20 years, and I quote a number of economists on that globally, although it's going down here in the United States. So it is possible it, to to disagree on where the factual consensus is, but you mentioned you mentioned China. China's the greatest thought experiment in this that's ever been conducted. If you looked at China, as I do, and it's better than it looks, 25 years ago versus today, poverty has dramatically declined, inequality has dramatically increased, mm -hmm. Which is better? Isn't China better off with less poverty and more inequality? You would and think so. Based on current economics, now I hope someday this will change, but based on current economics, China probably couldn't have improved its material circumstances so much without also creating the opportunities for government corruption that have led to the, to the very rich getting very richer in China. Okay, Quinn so wanted in first. Yeah, yeah. Just to, just to uh, make sure we're all on the same page, I do not disagree that in the last 20 years, there's been a small decrease in inequality. I was giving you the metric over 200 years where there's been this okay. huge increase in inequality right. over that period of time. Right. And, you know, that's, that's, I think, quite important. I do think that um, it's really useful to think of poverty. And if you think of poverty as absolute poverty, a dollar a day and you measure mm -hmm. poverty as a dollar a day, uh, I think you get to the point of saying, well, you know, there are loads of places in the world where absolute poverty has decreased. But in high income countries, we don't measure absolute poverty because we don't think a dollar or a dollar ninety a day is reasonable. Right. And we measure poverty in different ways. It's not just the money, it's dignity, it's participation, it's uh, being able to move forward with your life. 
uh, it's being able to be part of society. It's it's a different, different thing. Different set of standards. Yeah, and so really we need is. to we and, need to think more about poverty if we're going to talk I about it. I agree with Kwame. And, and, and just to add to what Kwame said, even if you look at poverty in the poorest countries in the world, the World Bank standard is real purchasing power of a dollar a day, Steve. And that's so low that what we know about those, that measure is that the risk of slipping back into absolute poverty is so large for this group of people because any climate disaster, any recession, there is no resilience and there's a very large group of people just above that line that can, will be pushed back into poverty at the first economic downturn or natural catastrophe hmm. of any kind. So the, the data in this sense, when you look at that absolute poverty measure, are genuinely misleading. Let me introduce a new idea here. And Greg, admittedly, it's a bit cheeky of me to quote somebody else's book to you, given that you have written about this as well. But humor me for a second. Here's Johan Norberg, the author of a book called Progress, who says, part of our problem is one of success. As we get richer, our tolerance for global poverty diminishes so we get angrier about injustices. Is he onto something there? Oh, uh, definitely. When you, when, when you follow today's news or, or go on a college campus, read modern authors, you think, geez, these, these grievances are getting smaller and smaller and ever more specialized. I think that's great. That's a sign that major grievances like lack of food and housing are certainly not resolved, but have positive curves, so we're looking for smaller and smaller things to become upset about. Environmental policy here in the United States, where I know the data and the law is pretty well, is very much like that. The major problems, smog, acid rain, etc., have been resolved, and now we're starting to concentrate on the smaller, less obvious problems. That's a great sign. So the fact that problems exist in a chain of cause and effect, you solve a couple of really bad problems here, you create 20 smaller problems here, uh, I think that's actually integral to progress. He's right about that. Janice, I want to ask you, you're on the biggest campus in the country. Yeah. Do, do you notice a change in the kinds of issues people are, are protesting about today versus 25 or 50 years ago? Yeah, uh, there's no question um, that that's true. Um, but again, I don't want us to take comfort uh, in the way that Greg just did. First of all... Why not? Why can't we I'll take comfort you, in that? Let me tell you why. Because if you look at the arc of history, one of the real risks is that we ignore these huge downturns. Um, and we just look at the average line over time. So if you did that for the 20th century, for example, you'd start in 1900, you'd get to 2000, and you would not see those 30 years that we all talked about. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't understand why that fall into hell was truly a fall into hell. There are factors in the world in which we live today. Greg just cited one. People are less and less open to reasoned arguments based on evidence. That is a huge, huge issue and doesn't suggest progress. In fact, it suggests regression. Mm -hmm. There is certainly a risk of nuclear war, which I think all of us are aware of, and many informed scientists are arguing that it is greater now than it has been in the last 30 or 40 years. Well, well the risk of nuclear war is greater now than it was the height of the Cold War between the USSR and the United States? Yes, because in effect we're dealing with one, quote, rogue state and frankly a rogue president. And the which, which one are you referring to? Well, I, I think the rogue president is in the White House okay. and he's more worrying than the rogue state. Um, but what that tells us is that the systemic constraints that were there even during the Cold War um, are not working hmm. in the same way. Quim. So to rule out these, the possibility of a deep dive down with huge damage, hmm. huge damage, I think is the problem with averages. I understand. I think it's quite important <clears throat> as well to be uh, clear that uh, averages don't tell the story. So okay. it's difficult to be comfortable with um, uh, indigenous um, sort of reserves where there's no clean water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and to say, well, we've made progress averagely and therefore it's okay. It's actually not. Uh, I've been to places where people are living on dollar a day, and uh, it's dehumanizing and it's terrible. I don't hear him saying it's okay. I hear yeah. him saying, let's make sure we all understand that progress has been made. Long way to go, 
but why ignore what achievements have been made? I understand that, and I don't think I'm saying that there's been no progress made. Uh, what I'm saying is very much as Janice is saying, okay, progress has been made, but this human pro a project that we're on is about uh, fairness, it's about moving people forward, mm -hmm. and to say, okay, well, we're, most of us are making progress and yeah, some people have been left behind. And the thing I probably uh, reacted to is this idea of there are little problems. Actually, you know, when you look at refugee crises, when you look at yeah. uh, those things that happen, when you look yeah. at climate change, when you look at the level of anxiety and mental health problems we have, when you look at dis disenfranchised people across mm -hmm. the world, these are not small problems. Okay, and let when me get you back to Greg here. The nuclear you. situation. Huge, the biggest, of course. We have now many nuclear nations, not just two. When you look at all of that, these aren't small issues, though I am an optimist. You don't sound it. But anyway, oh, no, I am I'm an optimist. <laughs> Let me move on. <laughs> you know. um, we had, uh, well, we've had this man on our program before, Yuval Noah Harari. We have a little clip here. This is actually not from our program, but from rather an event that the New York Times organized. And um, this was from, I guess this was from last month. And um, Greg, let's play a little clip here and then I'll get you to weigh in first once we hear the clip. The problem is on understanding the extremely complicated chains of cause and effect in the world. And again, my fear is that maybe Homo sapiens is just not up to it. We have created such a complicated world that we are no longer able to make sense of what is happening. Greg, it, does the growing complexity of the world in which we live create a kind of a fear of the future, which may account for why we're not prepared to acknowledge the progress that has been made? I, in, in it's better than it looks, I cite an important author who said that. Henry Adams, a century ago, said the world had become too complex to be comprehended anymore. And then I cite another important author who said that. Plato, 2,600 years ago, <laughs> said the same thing. I suspect that, that rapid change is partly the human condition. And that doesn't make it any easier to deal with. But I also think that we've come to an important verge in this conversation. We've been batting around the words optimism and pessimism. Obviously, you know from Steve Pinker, he's a big fan of optimism. Steve and I agree on that. That's one of our favorite words. We both use it constantly. But what does it really mean? Uh, and, and Bill Gates is also a big optimist. One reason he's liked both of our books, he loves that word. A lot of people don't like that word, including my president, Donald Trump. He's a classic pessimist. He hates any argument that things are getting better. But the key thing to understanding is to be an optimist doesn't mean that you're a Pollyanna. If it means, oh, I'm complacent, I don't care, everything will look after itself, yeah, that's not very good. Optimism is the best argument for reform. Optimism is the belief that that all the problems in our world can be fixed. I, I spend a whole chapter on inequality. I spend a whole chapter on climate change, looking at the reforms of the past that have worked, trying to apply them to the future. And optimism makes me think that we can fix those problems. And that's the key. Optimism is not complacency. That, that it's a very different point of view. We do know in this country, a guy named Trudeau won an election in 2015. Well, to saying better is always possible yeah. in Canada, and that really resonated. Right, so let's flip what Greg just said and say disappointment is the spur to better performance. And it's disappointment not only, and I come back to this, Steve, it's disappointment not only in material performance. Mm -hmm. um, do I have better drinking water than I had five years ago? I'm not sure, by the way, but leave that aside. But am I disappointed in the moral standards? that are shaping our, am I disappointed that reasoned argument is much more difficult to have? Am I disappointed that social media trades in half truth? Shares I'm sensing the, a yes to all three here so far. Yeah. yeah, so it's disappointment and there's a moral component to this which is generally absent from the discussion about optimism. We have to be, op in order to be optimistic, we have to believe that the capacity for human reason will prevail against not only complexity and uncertainty, mm -hmm. which is what you've all uh, put on the table, but against the culture that we're living in. And you're not there today. Which trashes evidence. I'm not there. You're not there today. No. I want to ask you, Quam, about mental health, because we, we uh, by all objective criteria, we as a sp species on this planet seem to be physically healthier now than we were 100 or 200 years ago. 
What about our mental health? The evidence on mental health is um, not clear. It depends where you are. Uh, but in general, I don't think the evidence is that we're more mentally healthy. And I think some of that is context. Uh, the material lives are one thing. Our spiritual lives are a different mm -hmm. thing. And also our connection to society are different, is a different thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, in order to be happy and balanced and at peace, um, you generally need a coherent life. And by that, I mean that there is a plan that you sign up to that you're given the support and you're given the time to make progress towards that plan. And the last thing is, you think it's worth it, hmm. okay? You need all of those things to be together, mm -hmm. to be coherent. And increasingly, when I'm speaking to people, they're talking about incoherence. It, you know, either they don't sign up to the plan or often they do sign up to the plan, but they just don't think well, it's worth it. I've got a minute left here. And speaking of incoherence, we've got to go back to Washington uh, for the final comment here. Greg, um, uh, that wasn't meant to be a cheap shot. At, well, maybe a little bit of a cheap shot at Washington. <laughs> Is there, in our last minute here, do you see an important difference on how liberals versus conservatives see or don't see the progress that has been made in the world? I don't, I, I'm not an ideological person. I don't split it up politically like that. I'm more with Quam on this, that I, I think you split it up objectively and subjectively. My, my current book, It's Better Than It Looks, is about what you can objectively measure. And I confine myself to those things. And objectively, certainly not every trend, but most trend is positive. I wrote a book a few years ago called The Progress Paradox about what's subjective in our lives. And there I'm very much on the same wavelength as Quam. I, I don't think that our subjective perception of ourselves has changed dramatically compared to past generations. And I think it all depends on the sense of meaning. If you believe that your my, life is meaningful, whether for religious or for ethical reasons, then you have a higher sense of your, uh, of your own self-worth and your own experience of life than if you believe your life is meaningless. And there's a lot of forces in our crazy culture that argue for meaninglessness. Well, I thought that was we a meaningful agree. conversation. And so we I want to thank you all for it. <laughs> Let me thank you all for it. Greg Easterbrook, uh, I know he said the title of his book three times. His publisher will be very happy about that. I'll say it a fourth. It's better than it looks. That's his uh, <laughs> contribution to our conversation tonight. Janice Stein from the Monk School of Global Affairs. Quam McKenzie from the Wellesley Institute. Great to have all of you back on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.